Hi, everybody, and welcome to the ASP.NET Monsters, episode number 36. Uh, we're going to continue our talking about distributed caches today by taking a look at Redis. So take us away, James. Yeah, we're, we've been talking a lot about caching lately. We've, we've, we've talked about um, uh, in-memory caching. We've talked about tag helpers that we can use to do caching. And the one of the last episodes we did was uh, Dave talking about distributed caching using SQL as a backend. And that was using a tag helper, again, to cache fragments or whatever the case may be of what was being rendered out in views. So if we want to cache at a lower level than that, and we want a little bit more control over how that data is actually, um, you know, what what aspect of the data that we're controlling, or perhaps um, a broader swath of data that we're controlling, and we're not necessarily as concerned about things like the view in terms of what we're trying to cache, then using it from a service implementation is an alternate approach. Now, this isn't to say that you can't use Redis caching with tag helpers and fragments and things like that. Um, of course we can. Redis is just another option for how we can do distributed caching. Okay, so what is Redis? Right, well, it's um, it's an in-memory data store, and it we basically use it to store key value pairs. So um, the, the key side of it is something that we probably want to be a little bit strategic in um, how we're actually breaking our data down. Redis will take care of the heavy lifting of the... Um, the sorting, the partitioning, and making it easier to access these bits for us as fast as possible. It takes that away from us. We don't have to worry about it. The value side of it can be anything that we can stuff into a byte array um, using the libraries that are available in .NET. So we can take any collection of, or any um, object or whatever, a, a string or just a number or whatever the case may be, and whatever that data is, we can store it in a byte array and throw it into Redis cache. So um, again, it's a it, it can be distributed, so it can you know it's it can be centralized as a as a store, so that multiple application servers can use the same backend caching, and we don't care if those app servers come online or go offline. The entire app, even if the application recycles, we can still be using the same cache. So we couldn't we could do something like set up a virtual machine and run Redis locally. We can install it, and in fact, there's actually a chocolatey package that we could use and. Mm. Um, it's just one line of text from the console and we've got a Redis server up and running. But I wanted to show a little bit of uh, something different here. And in this case, what I've done is I've actually set up um, an instance of the Azure Redis cache. So this is available. If you wanted to back your application, it starts at about $18 a month and that doesn't have an SLA. It scales up very, very quickly. And so if you want to go beyond the basic tier with 250 megs of cache, you can scale up to very big sizes where you can have, um, you know, for example, $500 a month per server and you could have, or per uh, Redis cache instance in Azure, and you could actually have six of those running and be paid, paying thousands of dollars a month in order mm -hmm. to, to back things up. So it depends on how big or small your application is, but it starts out in Azure for uh, less than a dollar a day. So, so the important thing to remember about the Redis cache on Azure is that it runs in volatile mode, which means that everything is stored in memory, and if something disastrous does happen, uh, there is a possibility that you will lose your keys, because Redis has two modes that it can run in. Uh, it can run in volatile mode, or it can run in like a, a write-through mode where it'll write to disk. So the the Azure version is not appropriate for like storing data long term. It's only good for storing stuff in a in a cached fashion. So you should be aware that there will be times where you go to that cache and that key may have been ejected from the cache. So it's the kind of data that you would want in there that you're able to rebuild on the fly and store, but not necessarily something that is mission critical or uh, it's not a per it's not in a permanent data store kind of mode. That's right. Okay. Excellent. So the other neat thing about this is it gives you, you know, like I've been playing around here and it's showing me cache hits and misses as I go. And um, it'll, yeah, just give me some basic inf information. When you get into some more, of, some more of the more advanced features and you go up from the basic pricing tier, there's even more interesting graphs and slices and different ways that you can look at it to see how your application's performing. Uh, in this particular case, I've got a lot of cache misses, but what you would see in an application where you're actually strategically caching data is you'd see a lot more cache hits. And this would be a significant improvement if you've got some long-running process to compute values or look data up that doesn't change 
um, too often or doesn't change or changes only on, you know, some way that you're aware of, uh, some kind of schedule that you're aware of. We're going to talk about invalidating cash here shortly. Mm -hmm. But um, it, for the most part, you, you, if you've got some strategy along the lines of this piece of data is going to be good for a period of time, then this is a really good option to use, as with most caches. Okay. So we get this set up. It's um, pretty straightforward. There's actually uh, one more thing in there that I'll show you really quickly if it comes up. Oops, there we go. Um, I can actually go into, um, uh, from this uh, screen here, I, I have to pull up a critical thing and I'm just gonna let it load. It's just taking a second here. The access keys will give me a connection string, primary and secondary, that I can use. And it gives me the opportunity to kind of obfuscate um, or add a layer of security to this cache so that other applications can't use it. But I've got this like two, there's two pieces to it. There's a primary and a secondary. If your primary key is compromised, you got a secondary to fall back and it lets you roll your keys right from within the interface as well. Um, I imagine, as most things are uh, in Azure, this would have been written in a uh, from the shell first. So there's probably PowerShell packages that you can use to automate these things as well if you want to roll your keys on a regimented kind of schedule. Okay, so we've got these. I would pull these out. I've just copied them already off to the side so I can use these. Uh, here we have the application running. And so now I want to just go to the controller where the caching is actually taking place. And this will take a second to load up. And what it does is it pulls back this uh, J... Gomez or Gomes or however it might be pronounced. I'm not actually sure. And what's important is that every time I'm, I'm hitting this, it's kind of hard to see from the front end, but this is a person that's actually cached. It's the same one. So uh, what I've done is I set up that there's a default lookup key of just A. And again, we'd want to use more intelligent lookup keys. But if I go and I hit uh, B instead, that's actually generating a new entry and throwing it, throwing that person up into cache on the fly. So let's have a look at what the moving parts are here in order to make this work. First of all, I've gone into project JSON and I've added a couple of packages to the project. The first one is caching abstractions. This is something that has some of the extension methods that we want in order to add um, our services during startup. And then the second one is the Redis package itself, which is actually a wrapper around the stack exchange Redis uh, package. So hmm. there's actually some, it's, it's basically the abstraction required in order to make it fit in the I distributed caching um, uh, interface. That's, let me just make sure I've got that right. It is an I distributed cache interface. So it's just basically a wrapper over that in order to make that work. So we don't have the full implementation of that library. We've just got the abstraction over top of it. So we could take that on and talk to Redis directly if we wanted to, but this is enough to suit our needs. So that's yeah, the first Redis. step. Redis is super simple to talk to. You can use Redis over Telnet, in fact. There you go. Yeah. Okay, so in startup, this is basically where we add our distributed cache capabilities. So we just say add distributed Redis cache, and then we pass in the options, and we give it our connection string. That's what we copied out of that um, interface in Azure in this case. Next thing that we do is we do some kind of implementation. Now, in a previous one, I kind of did some caching on the fly, but what I wanted to do is actually show how we might use a service and some dependency injection to actually inject a service that had the capability of doing caching um, into a controller. So now my controller doesn't know anything about caching. It just knows about this particular um, an instance of this particular class, I could have used an interface, those kinds of things. And dependency injection is actually going to pass the service in for me. Uh, you can see here I've got a default key of A and that's what's being set. And then when I go into my cache service, this is where we've got things that are a little bit more interesting. So I accept this key. Uh, sorry, I'll just pop back in. Oh, here I am. Yeah. I accept this key in my get entry and then I attempt to get it asynchronously, so I just have a little async await going on here. If my entry is null, then it wasn't found in the cache, so I create a new one, and then I encode it into a byte array, and then I set that value, and ultimately I return the result. So um, again, here's my, my new up. Now we had, we've had a couple of uh, episodes where we've talked about gen foo, so this is just creating a new, a realistic set of data inside of an object that's that we kind of hinted at using generic. So when I need a new instance of a person, then 
GenFu can do that up for me. So that's just another project uh, dependency that I've taken on, where person is just a simple class with first name, last name, and email address. So I now this I'm emulating what might happen if I had to go and look this up in a database or something that caught, it was a little bit more expensive to do, like some kind of some maybe I've got some file I/O, maybe there's some computational things that have, has to happen. Maybe I have to go to four or five different tables in order to build up a view model that can be cached reliably. In this particular case, I've also added the option of saying that this is going to expire in 60 seconds. As a result, when I go back to my default value, I'm sure I've talked more than a minute already. I can hit this cached info and I've got a different address. Now it's Jacqueline Butler instead of the Gomes name that was used in that first one. However, if I hit this again, you know, just for the next minute, the same Jacqueline Butler is going to keep coming up and after a minute expires, this Jacqueline Butler will go away. So now I'm just watching the clock and we're going to try and fill some uh, airtime here as we pass a minute. Any other interesting Redis bits you'd like to share with us, Simon? Yeah, so one of my favorite things about Redis is that uh, one of the, it stores a bunch of different data types, and here we're just serializing this thing out into a, a string, basically. But one of the ones that I really like uh, is that you can store an integer in there, and it, the operations on that integer are atomic. So it's really, really nice for things like a counter. Uh, so if you have something on your website where you just want to count up, um, which is quite a complicated problem uh, in a to, to do in a distributed fashion, like if you've got 20 machines talking to it and you want to just get the next integer, uh, then Redis is a good way of doing that in an atomic way. Oh, there we go. And a minute has passed, and now Jocelyn Verstrate is the entry that we've got in that cache position. So again, kind of a, not a not a really maybe a, a realistic thing that we would be caching, but a semi-realistic approach. Did I have the thing in cache, which is the check to get it from cache is cheaper than actually going and getting that thing or building that object up. So I'm going to try to get it from cache first. And if it doesn't exist, I go and I build it or I look it up or I do whatever computational things need to be done. And then I just store it in cache and, and away we go. So I'm going to now just, uh, we're going to be, do some debugginess here and we'll just watch what actually happens. All right, Redis trivia number two is that uh, you can put Lua scripts inside Redis and they will execute in that same single threaded context. So if you need to do something complicated, like a kind of a pseudo transaction, pull a bunch of data from different places, calculate a value, put it back into Redis somewhere, you can write a Lua script and upload that into Redis and it will run that uh, on demand. So it's kind of like, poor man's transaction. Um, the only thing to keep in mind is that, of course, because Redis is single-threaded, uh, if you do something overly complicated inside of that Lua script, there is the possibility that you could lock up the whole server. But everybody here writes perfect code, so... So we don't have to worry about any it's not mal effects. Yeah, no. Everything that I write, uh, especially my sorts, all run in O of one time. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Somewhere my algorithms professor who had no sense of humor is not very happy right now. Okay, we're going to try that again. <laughs> Pretending that we're... So well, I'm jump. so glad this is going to be so easy to edit. Okay. Yeah. So now that we've got the application back up and running, we're debugging. I'm going to go to the controller where we're caching things. And... Right away, we'll see I've got in uh, Visual Studio, I'm going to hit my breakpoint. And we can see here that the cache has been passed in. So that's set up for, for us via dependency injection. We're, this is now the caching service that we've created. It's not the actual Redis um, pieces because this is the controller. So now I'm going to go, I'm going to get past this here. I'm going to go look into the... Um, into the service itself. And it tries to get the cache... So the entry is null, so it was not found. It was not, uh, we did not get a hidden cache. So we're going to go in and I'll just step into this. We're going to create a new instance of that um, person here in this next line as we enter this block of code. We serialize it. We create an entry in 
uh, which is just our byte array, and then we are going to push that up to the cache, and then we're going to continue about our merry way, and we're going to load that page. So that null entry there is what might be known as a mandatory cache hit, meaning that there's no way that the cache could have had that value in it beforehand, so it's okay to miss that one. Right, so now I've got an Eric Smith in here, and if I hit the cache info again, I don't have any breakpoints set, so it comes back right away. So again, uh, there's going to be times where we have, as you said, a, a cache hit is guaranteed, there's no way around it. Other times we can work with these expirations in a number of different ways. Let's have a look at that really quickly, because that is something that is important. There's there's a couple of things, maybe we've got something, a, an aspect of our our application that we can cache for um, a predetermined set of time. So, for example, every hour we want to regenerate a set of statistics that are going to be displayed. So I could actually say, okay, from I could do time span from minutes and say 60 minutes or from hours, one hour kind of thing. In this particular case, I'm saying an absolute expiration relative to this point in time. So this is going to live for a minute starting now. But I've got a couple of other... Um, options that I can use as well. So, for example, um, let's see here. I can use an absolute expiration. So, perhaps I wanted to expire at midnight every day um, at a specific time, or I can use a sliding expiration, which is a strategy that says anytime somebody hits it, let's leave this in cash for the next hour, and we just, or the next minute, or the next day, or whatever it's going to be. But every time somebody hits it, we just say, somebody was trying to get it, let's leave that in there. And we just keep sliding the expiration as long as is required. Now, with the default implementation of this package that's brought in, these are the only options that I've got. And I also don't have a way, and I'll just uh, show you here right now, I don't have a way to do any kind of invalidation. However, I can remove keys if I know that they exist, but there's no way for me to actually flush out the cache and just drop all the keys. So it's just an important thing to mm. remember if you're using this abstraction that they've got for Azure, um, the abstraction implementation, the implementation of the abstraction does not actually contain a way to flush the, the keys out of memory. Okay, so um, those are the basics. We've got a couple of packages to add. We have to add the service, the uh, distributed cache Redis service right here in our startup uh, under configure services. And then uh, we just need to take a dependency on iDistributed cache as part of a constructor that's going to be built up in our request chain and we've got access to the distributed cache. Fantastic. Excellent. This was an easy episode to get through. I hope that everyone was Absolutely. able to get something out of it. And um, thank you, Simon, for the tips and facts and trivia on Redis Cache. Great. No problem. It was uh, wonderful recording it. And we'll see everybody on the next episode of the ASP.NET Monsters. Cheers. Cheers.